we're going to talk about cowboys. If we're looking at p-values, what is it that we're really thinking about? So I like to start with this question about coin flipping cowboys. So if we imagine that there are 100 cowboys and each of these cowboys is going to flick a coin 100 times each, we can start to make some guesses about what is a typical score at the end of that 100 flicking cycle. So most of us would probably assume that the average score is going to be 50, 50, 50 heads and 50 tails, right? So 50, 50 is going to be the average score, but we know that there's going to be variance. So I've, I've drawn a hundred cowboys for you. So here are a hundred cowboys. So imagine we've asked these cowboys just to stand on a point in a barn, wherever their score was while they were flicking their coins. So obviously in the very middle, we're going to have our average Joe, the, the cowboy who flipped 50-50 perfectly. And he's going to be representative of the majority of cowboys. Uh, but out at the ends of the distribution, we're going to get these lucky cowboys, these cowboys that like there was nothing special about the cowboy and there's nothing special about the coin that they're flicking. It's just that the score that they got happens to be very far from average Joe, right? So if we think about these lucky cowboys, out of 100 cowboys, there are five lucky cowboys, the five that are furthest from the mean score, which is equivalent to one lucky cowboy in 20. So if we use the p-value of 0.05, all we mean is the five luckiest cowboys. So if we assume there's nothing special about the cowboy and nothing special about the coin, the p-value of p.05 is those five most deviant responses. Now I've mentioned here that that's equivalent to one lucky cowboy in 20. And this is really important for us when we think about how we design and how we analyze our studies because if we think about the kinds of studies that we do either in psycholinguistics or in other fields of psychology or language science, we often collect huge quantities of data that can be analyzed in more than one way. And if one cowboy in 20 is a lucky one, then if we have 20 options for analyzing our data, one of those, those cowboys is gonna be lucky. Imagine that we have a coin flipping competition and you might say, I'm gonna bet on black hats versus white hats. But if this competition is going to work, you have to place your bets before the coin flipping starts. And that's the basics of pre-registration. We can think about scientific research in two different streams. We can have exploratory research and we can have hypothesis testing. And they, they play different roles at different stages of the research cycle. So when we think about exploratory scientific research, we might think about something like drug discovery. And when we think about drug discovery, we could say, I own a giant pharmaceutical company, which I don't, but imagine that I did. I might have 1,400 drugs on the shelf, and I might be able to say, are any of them possibly suitable in this health crisis? Is like, let's just see if we can find a lucky cowboy. Because right now, it's really urgent that we find some lucky cowboys so that we can then go on to figure out if they are going to save lives, right? But that second stage, the clinical drug trial, is a separate process. Once you've identified your lucky cowboy, and when you have a lucky cowboy, you genuinely don't know whether it's simply lucky or whether there's something about it that makes it special. Uh, you can take that forward into hypothesis testing where you might say formula G looks promising. Our new hypothesis is that G will cure cancer or cure COVID-19. Uh, so let's do a, an RCT, a randomized controlled trial to test it, its effectiveness. So what I'm trying to do here is separate out these two pathways to effective research. One is exploratory where we don't really have a clear hypothesis for what's going to be interesting. And the other one where we have a clear hypothesis and we're going to test that one. Uh, to use a, another 
comedy example that some of you may be familiar with, I love this example from the, the comic XKCD. Uh, so the comic starts with this idea, jelly beans cause acne, which sounds like a hypothesis. Scientists investigate. Uh, and the scientists come back and report, we found no link between jelly beans and acne. That settles it. And someone uh, responds, I hear it's only certain colors that cause uh, acne. Scientists! And what follows uh, is a fantastic demonstration of this potential for lucky cowboy science, right? Uh, so the scientists report, we found no link between purple jelly beans and acne. We found no link between brown jelly beans and acne. We found no link between pink jelly beans and acne, blue jelly beans and acne, teal jelly beans and acne, air, salmon, uh, red, turquoise, magenta, yellow, gray, tan, cyan, green, mauve, beige, lilac, black, peach, orange, and eventually the newspaper article, green jelly beans cause uh, linked to acne right so what we need to be careful about is if we report only the news that green jelly beans cause acne we're reporting the lucky cowboy without the rest of the context that might tell us that this is just a lucky finding so if you present exploratory data analysis, as though it's hypothesis testing, your stats are wrong. So, tip one uh, in sort of understanding the role of pre-registration, what it's for and how we can do it, is simply to be clear about which kind of research you're describing. There is nothing wrong with exploratory research. We just have to be aware that we need to conduct our statistics in a slightly different manner. Uh, and we need to keep in mind the appropriate corrections for all of the supplementary tests that we ran. And tip number two, and this is where pre-registration comes in, is we just have to provide evidence if we are doing hypothesis testing. We just have to show our betting slip, right? If we can write down the hypothesis that we had before we began and lodge it with the bookmaker, then when that result comes in, it's something that we can prove we predicted right at the beginning. Uh, okay, so many of you, if you've joined for a workshop on pre-registration, will probably be familiar with um, what are known in the, in the literature as weak research practices. So you may have heard of p-hacking, uh, which is this idea that out of all of the tests that you've run, uh, you might be looking for one, anything that reaches the magic threshold of P.05, or you might try and find a way of um, uh, torturing your data until it confesses a p-value of P.05 or less. What I'm going to be focusing on a little bit more today, though, is the Garden of Forking Paths, also known as the Branching Lane, uh, and uh, optional stopping, which is the idea that when you are in the middle of a research project, if you know that these lucky cowboys pop up one in 20 times, there's always the chance that you might see one come past and think, oh, I'll stop now. If I run one more participant, it might go away again. Or equally, if you think, oh, I haven't reached my magic number, maybe I'll just run five more participants. Maybe I'll just run two more participants. Maybe I'll just run 10 more participants. Oh, I've got a magic number. So optional stopping is this uh, potential problem when knowing the outcome of your tests can bias how you run your tests, if you're running your tests incrementally. So those are the two we'll be talking about mostly today, but we'll also have a few uh, other concepts uh, coming up as we go along. Now, if you really want to expand your knowledge on weak research practices and what it means for the field of uh, social sciences, in particular psychological sciences, but also relevant to the, to the language sciences, um, 
then I can recommend uh, Chris Chambers' Seven Deadly Sins of Psychology, which has a really nice way of laying out all of these problems. So I thought I'd take us straight into some really concrete examples. So the Garden of Forking Paths is a metaphor that describes uh, if we have several research decisions to make in a sequential manner, each of those decisions might seem like it's driven by the logic of the experiment that we're running, but the multiplicative probability space that we create when we have multiple decisions to make is enormous. So if we imagine an EEG study, and for those of you who are familiar with EEGs, you will understand a little bit about what's going to come next, I hope. Um, you may have completed your EEG recording with a full hat of electrodes and whatever equipment you had at the very beginning. But the first decision you might have to make is, are you going to filter your data to remove extraneous noise that could not possibly be uh, related to the neurological signals you're interested in? So you might apply an offline filter uh, with some kind of a low pass threshold. Now there are potentially a million different levels that you could pick, but there might be one that's a, a very small value, one that's a very high value, and then something in the middle. So let's imagine that out of that full range of possibility space, there's say three options. The second decision you're gonna to have to make is what you do with the high pass filter. So the, the filter at the other end of the uh, frequency spectrum. Uh, and again, there'll be three different possible options. Now, for the moment, if you just ignore the color, the color will make more sense a little bit later on. But again, um, you might have a low value, a high value, and a mid-range value out of all of the possible options that are available to you. Once you've performed your filtering, you have decisions to make about whether you're going to accept or correct artifacts. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, just in the basic data processing, every time you make a decision about inclusion or exclusion, or how you're going to average your data, how you're going to, uh, which electrodes you're going to use, whether you're referencing to mastoids or a linked mastoid, every time you make a decision, it multiplies the possibility space. Uh, this effect is even more consequential once you take that pre-processing down into your decisions about analysis, where you can choose um, different combinations of electrodes in the montage that you're going to analyze uh, and different options for how you're going to construct your uh, critical comparisons. And this is, these are the kind of decisions that we make even when we're doing a study of something like N400. And the reason I give the example of N400 is um, partly because I've been involved in N400 studies in the past uh, and gone through this, this huge uh, complex possibility space, um, but also because it's one of the most robust, well-known uh, neuropsychological effects in psycholinguistics. It's replicable, it's reliable, we've known about it for decades. And yet, even within this space, there are more than 800 options for how you can get from your raw recording to your N400. Now, this means the, the possibility space is so large, there's the chance for p-hacking. But there's also the chance that if you make your decisions in a different way, you might miss a true effect. Now, you might think that I'm just trying to make a big deal out of nothing, but we, um, a team of us, uh, headed by Angela Sotic at the University of Belgrade, uh, recently conducted a study of the literature looking at precisely these questions. If we just look at every N400 study that's been published since the discovery of the N400s with a, a certain couple of um, uh, and methodological criteria, so it had to be an audio speech sample and a visual picture that were presented, we wanted to know what does the literature look like if we just ask, is it clear in the literature how we could decide which way to go through that garden? So if we just 
take every paper that's been published with audio and a picture for people to look at. Can we find our way through the garden without p-hacking? And the answer is that across the entire literature, about half of the details are either not described accurately enough to even follow one paper or completely missing. And when we uh, first started this study, uh, we knew it was going to be challenging, <laughs> but we didn't know it was going to be quite this complicated. So just to zoom in a little bit more on some of those decisions. So we have online filters, what was the slope high, uh, for the high pass, the low pass, how many details were given about analyzed trials, blah, 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 blah. So because we know that there is this huge possibility space and it's hard to find our way through that path, um, one of the research tools that we have available is simply stating at the very beginning, what is it we plan to do? Which way do we plan to go through that garden? So this brings us to the question of what is fundamentally, what is a pre-registration? And all it is, it only takes two pieces of information. One, you describe how you're going to go about catching your hypothesis fish with enough detail that you can't p-hack. So you can't just change your mind later when it turns out that the horse that you bet on or the cowboy that you bet on just doesn't cross the finish line. And the second piece of information that we need is just documenting that somewhere. Uh, so the, the gold standard is to make that documentation in an independent archive uh, that contains a, a timestamp uh, and um, is either a permanent uh, repository or has some kind of version control so that if you change your mind afterwards, the original and the changed version are, are both documented, right? And the reason that it's important to document in an independent archive is because, uh, to use a Singaporean expression, own self is the easiest to fool. So uh, you might get to a stage in your research where you're like, oh, I wish I had had decided to do it this way instead of this way. And you might be able to talk yourself into, well, that's what I really meant all along, when in actual fact that wasn't the case from the start. So if you want to keep own self honest, uh, you need an independent archive of some sort. Okay, so... How does pre-registration fit into the research pipeline? Well, the current standard is that we have some vague idea of what it is we want to investigate and how we're going to investigate it. We collect our data, we inspect the data, and after we've inspected the data, we plan the analysis. Uh, we might analyze it, we might reanalyze it, we might decide to collect more data, go back to the start, inspect and plan our analyses. Um, and after we've done that for some months, we might write the full article, submit the manuscript, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we wait to find out whether we're accepted and rejected. Um, we might be asked to resubmit. We might be asked to run more participants or an additional study to clarify the pattern in our data. The, the difference, the core difference that we have with pre-registration is we have a really specific plan for how we're going to catch this hypothesis, not just what we're interested in, but precisely how. So we archive the pre-registration right at the beginning before we've seen any data, and that pre-registration contains the analysis plan. After that, we collect the data, we analyze in line with the rules of our pre-registration, when we write our full article, we refer to the pre-registration um, and we can submit the pre-registration alongside the article that we submit. Uh, and because it acts as this secondary sanity check on whether or not we're just fishing for results, uh, it can in some ways smooth the review process. Now, not all reviewers are completely on board with pre-registration and not all are familiar with it. Uh, but as far as the community of people who are, uh, are writing up 
pre-registered reports at the moment, it seems that not too many um, uh, reviewers are actually against pre-registration. They might ignore them or they might love them, but they're usually not anti-pre-registration. The, the tip I want to throw out there, this is tip number three, is pre-registration helps you make design decisions about your scientific research. Uh, by specifying your hypothesis plan, you have to make decisions like whether your research will be within or between subjects, how many groups, how many levels you're going to compare, have you got any dummy variables. You also have to decide which measurements are the ones that you're focusing on and which computations are you going to run. Uh, you have to decide how many people and how will you stop. So stop rules are great. You can have a target sample size, but you can also have a date. So if you know your funding is going to run out on the 27th of December 2020, then you can put a target recruitment level and an absolute stop rule that says when you won't be able to collect any more uh, participants and use an if-then logic to say uh, we will aim to recruit this many people up until uh, and continue up until this date. You also get to decide whether you have like a primary hypothesis um, and whether you also have like a secondary hypothesis, something else that you're interested in but you're not ready to bet on in quite the same way. <laughs> Uh, you can also describe some parts of your study as completely exploratory. So if you're doing the kind of study that has one very finely um, expressed hypothesis, but there's lots of other data in the environment, there may be other questions Ask of that rich data set that you're, you're genuinely not sure what you're going to find, and that's fine, so long as you specify at the very beginning which of those questions are hypothesis testing and which ones are exploratory. Right. So um, tip number four, pre-registration is actually easier than most people think because there are some beautifully simple templates that can just be what you need to put in, right? So the one I like to share as a like starter pre-registration, haven't done one before and you just want to dip your toe in the water without uh, committing uh, too much time or resources to how this process will work. Um, Active is a great way to start. It's a little website that has a very short list of questions. The first one is have any data been collected for the study already? Uh, so obviously, if you're registering prior to any data collection, you can simply state no. Hypothesis, we've already done specifying the hypothesis. Um, the rest of the questions are that second part, the pre-registration, which is specifying the hypothesis with enough detail that you not be hack. So you have to say which measurement is the one that you really care about how many groups, how many conditions for your participants, how are you going to analyze, how do you decide who's in and who's out, how do you decide how many people, and if there's anything else. And this other section is great because it's where you can put things like, in addition to all of this, uh, we have an exploratory question about blah, 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 blah. Uh, it can be anything uh, that you think might be uh, possible to come out data. The other thing I like to point out at this point is that if your uh, research does not go as predicted, that's fine. You can deviate from the pre-registration so long as you own up to it. Uh, just as a recap, tip number one is if you're clear which kind of research you're describing, hypothesis testing or exploratory, then it helps your reader to understand the role that your stat A uh, when you present them. Tip two, just document decisions. Pre-registration doesn't have to be hard, but these pre-registration templates, tip three, help you make design decisions, like how many kids you're gonna run and whether you're gonna do cross-sectional or longitudinal research. Tip number four, those templates can push you to remember to think about some of these details that we sometimes forget. But given that pre-registration can improve your scientific productivity, 
uh, it's a great bonus and pay attention to.